to the League of Women Voters of the North Woods uh, monthly meeting. And um, thank you all for joining. And um, today on our program, we are going to be speaking with Linda Conlon, who's the director of the Oneida County Health Department. Um, as a reminder, um, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization and uh, we will have plenty of opportunity for questions, um, but uh, let's, let's keep it to questions, not statements, if we can help that. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna just do a little brief intro here for Linda. Um, she has spent 24 years in public health. She is the ideal person to bring us up to date in the discussion for the virus in our area. Well, and parenthetically, back in April when we first got her on the program, we didn't, we, we had realized we needed to be responsive and, and switch to talking about this because that was not the original agenda, but we can't not be talking about this at this point. So she has a bachelor's degree in nursing, her master's degree in public health. She is the former president of the Wisconsin Public Health Association and the Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards. And currently she is the co-chair of their combined joint public affairs committee. She has also served on various state and regional work groups focusing on public health quality improvement, research and public health preparedness. And parenthetically, she is also my boss because I do, I'm part of her contact tracing team. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda and thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, always happy to talk to um, any group of individuals who want to talk about COVID. And, and as Jean indicated earlier, when I was first asked, that wasn't the ask. It was more about um, public affairs and more about legislation, but um, tables have turned since that ask, as we all know and it has turned towards COVID. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our current data in Oneida County, and then I am going to answer the questions that were already posed to me, um, and then I will open it up for just a Q&A. And I'm happy to, um, you know, as Jean indicated, answer any questions that you have for me. So what I'm first going to do um, is again, share our most current data. So right now you all should be seeing our webpage. Is that correct? It says adult flu vaccine. Okay, so this is what our webpage looks like. This is the front page. We've got a scroller. I'm just gonna go down just so you're aware. I'm not gonna go through this, but you know, this is what our front page looks like. But the important stuff that you guys care about is right here at the top of the page. In these bubbles, we have our Onward Oneida County Reopening Guidance and Metrics. This we did right away, and it honestly hasn't, we haven't moved from phase to phase because nothing ever went away. Um, the intent was to be able to kind of open and close with the flow, um, but things just continued to get worse until they're at this point that we are now. This bubble right here is what I'm gonna go over. This is our data, but we also have information just so you know about COVID-19, what you can do if somebody tests positive, and I'm just gonna go right into that section right now. If somebody tests positive, there is some next steps. And we're gonna talk about this because we're gonna talk about contact tracing. And the reason why it's necessary for us to have this information in here, such as notifying close contacts of their exposure. Um, and are you a contact? Here's quarantine guidance, here's isolation guidance, etc. So there's a reason why we have this bubble here and Jane and I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then these are just influenza, just so you know, we do have influenza available and there is no appointment for that. And we also have COVID testing. So our community COVID testing site is at Grace Four Square Church, which is um, north of uh, Menards and it is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you could go here 
and you could schedule an appointment for a Tuesday or Thursday for COVID testing. So that's a great community service that we are, we are partnering with the National Guard on providing uh, testing for our community through December 10th. After December 10th, we're unsure of what the Guard is going to be able to do, but we do have this site available to us through December 10th. So moving on to our data, this, um, let me see if I can get this a little bit bigger for everyone. Okay, that's better. So this data is, some of it is changed daily. Most of it is changed weekly. Most of you probably know that data is precarious and it takes about a week or so to clean, which means to remove bad data, to make sure everything is accurate before we present that to the community. But the things that we do present daily is right here in the dark blue. So this is what we present to the community daily. And we also have this on our Facebook site. And that's probably the easiest place to get these daily numbers is on our Facebook site. But currently we have uh, 16,024 people that have tested positive in Oneida County. 493 of those are active and we currently have 19 hospitalizations. We have had 12,888 negatives with 1,093 people or 67.3% of all cases recovered. We have had 19 deaths, which is one, a 1.2 1 percentage. We have done 14,558 total tests. 70, 79 individuals or 5% of the individuals have ever been hospitalized and 16 were in ICU or 1%. That was last updated yesterday. We tend to do our updates between 7 and 8 p.m. Um, because we have contact tracers that work until 7 p.m. 7 p.m. So we don't um, we want to wait for as much data to come in before we post these three areas. Our burden, which is our case rate, is um, very high, and that's 1205.7. This is how many cases we have per 100,000 in the last two weeks. This data is pulled from DPH, as is our current activity level. So our activity level is based off of burden, which is the number of cases per 100,000, and our trajectory, which is the percentage change in the last two weeks, and we are also very high. This trajectory is no significant change. That means it hasn't gone significantly up and it hasn't gone significantly down in the last two weeks. And that is spread across two weeks. So, and we've been pretty high, um, but holding steady, I guess, as you will for two weeks. The percent of confirmed cases and the seven day average by testing date. Um, so our percent positive is you know, starting on 1027 is 31%. Um, the seven day average on 1028 was 26%, 26, 24, and 24. So, you know, this, this is a look back. You can see the last day here is 1031. Again, that is because we need to make sure that we're reporting data accurately. Our incidents per 100,000, this is the second graph here. Our seven day average is 66.3, which is quite high. But as you can see, this daily number does change based on our number of cases day to day to day. And then our weekly average number of days for test results, you can see this has fluctuated. You, the most that we have seen is 3.4. 3.3, but that's still quite a while to wait for test results, as you will. But, but that is the average we're seeing for our test results. This page talks about demographics. These are people that were confirmed with COVID. Yeah. So as you can see, one of the largest symptoms <clears throat> of people confirmed with COVID in our area is a cough at 36%. And then we've got some other close numbers. Fatigue is 27%. 
Headache is 28%. Muscle aches are 24%. So these are the symptoms that people are, are experiencing when they have COVID. This has, changed, this has remained relatively steady, um, but will be interesting a note when we get to hospitalizations, you'll see a little bit of difference. So the number of females that are testing positive for COVID are at 51.24 and the number of males 48.9, sorry, 48.69. Other either people don't wanna tell us or, or they have um, other, other characteristics or other they um, identify as a different gender 0.07. Confirmed cases by age, look at this age group, 12%, 12%, 12%. I mean, from 20 to 49, we're at 12%. Those numbers are actually higher than our 70 to 79 group, which is at 11%. Our largest by far is the 19 and 18 percentages of our 50 to 69 year olds. A lot of that is the working and the employment. Um, and then you can also see that kids 10 to 19 are increasing in our percentages. This used to be really low, but now we're at 8% in that age group and 3% in the under 10 year olds. So if you were to look at children 19 and under, they also make up 11%, which is pretty significant as well. What this diagram down in the right corner is, is just our numbers in our different townships. People were wondering um, the highest numbers where people were. The black arrows indicate that they went up a level. So they went up a level this week in all of these areas, meaning that Manaqua is like at this orangey color um, and they were at a um, red color previously. So, um, Again, this really just shows um, the cases in each of the townships. So now let's turn to the people that were hospitalized. Now, when you look at hospitalizations, if you remember women was 51 point some percent female, they were, that was the cases that were how many were positive and males were 48 point something. When you look at the hospitalizations, men, are at 54.67% hospitalized and women, females are at 45.33. So there is a slight difference by gender of hospitalizations. Those males that become positive with COVID have a higher chance, albeit not a lot higher, but a higher chance of becoming hospital, hospitalized than females. These are our averages for, um, or our hospital percentages for each age group. Our average age is 73, 70 to 79, 30%, 39% of our hospitalizations are age 70 to 79, 29% are 80 plus, 21% are in the age group of 60 to 69. And then as you can see, we have some small percentages for all of the other younger population. So we are still seeing hospitalizations in those younger groups. Our ICU beds that are available um, is four out of 16. So we only have 25% of our ICU beds available to us, meaning that it's not just for COVID patients. Remember, if we have any car accidents, automobile accidents, UTV accidents, you know, anything like that, even significant illness, they also need ICU beds. It's not just the COVID people that need ICU beds. So we only have four of those available in Oneida County, but we do have all of our ventilators available to us. The last document, the last page on our data is what we call our HERC region. And this is our healthcare emergency readiness coalition. And these are all of the counties that are in the coalition. And what this is, is that um, this looks at factors that we use in Onward Oneida County. It looks at our hospitals. So, you know, right now we have 14 positive cases in healthcare workers in the last 14 days. That puts us at a yellow category. We should be watching this for um, COVID cases of healthcare workers. Our PPE that's available for all healthcare workers 
um, that is also in the yellow area. That means that hospitals do not have a greater than seven days of PPE. Um, so again, that's an area to watch. This for crisis care, it says that 95% of the hospitals affirm that they can treat all patients without crisis care. And then it also indicates that there is some availability of testing of hospital staff. These are really starting to become questionable. Um, I won't be surprised if they turn to yellow quite soon. As far as testing supplies and staff to facilitate adequate testing for disease control, we're in the inadequate, inadequate category or red. Um, and then for COVID-like symptoms, moderate, which is to be expected. And then we are still low with influenza-like illness being reported in this area. So with that, um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to open it to questions just on the data right now before I continue so that I can stop sharing that screen. If people have any questions on data, please let me know. All right, hearing none, I will stop sharing my page. Um, one thing that I did was, um, I answered some of the questions beforehand that were given to me, and I would like to run through those. Um, there wasn't very many questions, but I thought I could run through those first, and then we can open up the floor for questions. The first question that came in was, how does a family handle a Thanksgiving celebration in the time of COVID? The CDC and the state of Wisconsin has some great resources, and now that executive order number 94, although it's not an order, it's a recommendation, but it's still executive order number 94 came out. It's really not recommending people travel for Thanksgiving or people have extended family for Thanksgiving or that they have people outside of their household. But I'm gonna go through this anyway because not everybody listens to the governor. And I think it's important for us to, um, to get this information out. It is a, it's a position that I have been in numerous times, whether I stick to my guns and just say, well, the governor's order or the governor's recommendations is absolutely no travel, absolutely no celebrations, absolutely none of this, or do I look at the whole picture and say, not everybody's going to listen to that. So is it important for me to at least give out information on how people can be as safe as possible. And I, I guess, you know, I, I look at the 50-50 split in people's opinions about everything related to COVID. And if I can get out information for 50% of the people, um, that's what I'm going to do. I will still start any sentence that I have to the public. We do not recommend public gatherings. We do not recommend people travel. I mean, I will always start my sentence that way, but I say, if people choose to do this, this is what they can do. So let's just talk about Thanksgiving and actually um, Christmas and, and Hanukkah and, and all of the celebrations that are coming up around um, the holiday season. Let's talk a little bit about that. So family and friends are fun and, and, and we all want to get together with our family and friends. The safest way to celebrate this year is to celebrate only in your household. Um, but if you do plan to celebrate if with some extended family, maybe it's adult children um, that maybe not live in your household, but they are, they are social distancing and quarantining at home and, and you feel safe that your adult children can be with you um, and grandchildren, that might be a scenario, but we highly discourage anybody really outside of the family coming together for Thanksgiving. Um, one way that people can do it more safely, obviously, is to wear a mask. And, and we've heard these messages over and over. It is the, it is the three legged stool. It's the three factors that we always say, wear a mask, stay six feet away from each other and wash your hands. Doing anything outside is always better, but as we know, it's getting pretty cold in Northern Wisconsin and doing activities outside is difficult, but um, just from a personal perspective, that's what we are doing at Christmas is outdoor activities and 
and not bringing anybody inside. Um, but again, if you're going to attend a gathering, you could bring your own food, drinks, plates, cups, utensils. At this point, I don't know why you would even want to do a gathering if you're bringing all that on your own, but you know, maybe it's a takeout meal, right? <laughs> and then you just bring it in your container, but um, wear a mask, avoid going in and out of areas where food is being prepared or handled, such as the kitchen, and use single use options. I don't know if any of you took advantage of the outdoor seating at some restaurants that were, you know, really trying to have a good COVID response, but when you saw that, it was single use options. They always gave you you know, the ketchup, the mustard, the salad dressing in single use. They use um, plastic um, menus that could be wiped off, et cetera. Well, the situation remains the same for Thanksgiving. If you're gonna be having condiments and, and using condiment packets or um, little containers, individual containers versus um, passing it around and having everybody using the same um, condiments, and then as well, you could serve individual bowls of stuffing, individual bowls of potatoes. So again, they're not sharing that spoon. And the same goes if you're hosting, they suggest a small outdoor meal. Again, that's really difficult to do in our area, but hey, you know, maybe somebody has some heaters that they have outside and they can shovel off their deck if we've got snow, but um, limit the number of guests have conversations with your guests ahead of time. And I think that that is very important is how do you have that conversation with people either to say, you know what, I think we need to celebrate differently this year, or maybe we hold off or, or if we are gonna celebrate together, this is how we are doing it. Again, limit the number of people, try not to share food, have one person serve food. So if you're not gonna use the single use option, one person does the potatoes, the stuffing, et cetera. Um, travel, again, not recommended, but if you do, check out the travel restrictions before you go. Um, and of course, the CDC and DHS and everybody are gonna say, you should get your flu shot before you travel. That's not different than any other time. I'm always recommending that. Um, try not to use public transportation, wear your mask, social distance, et cetera. Um, and again, I think the biggest thing is, is maybe doing a Zoom meal with family and friends, schedule your meal together, watch a television or play games with people in your household so that it's more fun. Um, shop online, don't go to Black Friday sales, please don't go to Black Friday sales. Um, do your, your shopping online and um, there's also a way if you've got older parents or siblings, that you could maybe order their Thanksgiving meal and have it delivered to them um, and tell them that you're gonna be providing that meal for them and get it delivered to them as a nice way of saying, I'm thinking about you, um, but I don't think that we should celebrate together. So that's a great idea as well. Um, so so those, are, those are ideas of how to celebrate um, safely. And again, Christmas, Hanukkah, all the other holidays that are coming up um, will ha likely have the same type of recommendations. So it's very similar to what we did with Halloween. You know, we kind of said, don't go trick-or-treating, but if you do, here are the things that you can do. The next question that I have is, what is the health department's recommendations for children attending school? Should they or should they not? I've got some very short answers for this. Um, this is a parent's decision. The schools have implemented several strategies to keep kids safe in schools, such as masking, physical distancing, plexiglass, stricter sick policies, and COVID policies. There are many factors that the decision, including family's health, children's health, children's learning style, learning disabilities, mental health, social disabilities, parents having to work, a lot of parents do not have the flexibility to work from home. A lot of companies don't offer that. A lot of companies are not offering family medical leave related to COVID. There's many factors that play in children going to school besides just not spreading COVID. And we, we feel that we can't make that decision for the parent 
The Rhinelander School District has done a great job in offering blended learning at the high school and junior high level, which means kids are in two days, half the population is in for two days, then they're learning two days, distance learning, and then the other half of the population. So they cut their population in half at the middle school and high school. And at the grade schools, they have separated their desks, they've implemented a lot of strategies, um, felt that uh, the younger kids would have much more difficulty learning in a virtual environment. And um, we knew when the schools opened that there would be bumps in the road. Um, we've had complaints on both ends about being in school, being, of course, 50-50, just like everything else. Complaints of being in school, complaints of being out of school, parents upset that their kids have to quarantine for two weeks because they're considered a close contact. What I like to say is, is if our goal was to keep kids in school, and if you don't want your kids in school, you have the virtual option, but for those parents that need the kids in school and want their kids in school, there are gonna be bumps in the road. That means that we're gonna to have to quarantine kids for two weeks. That's just the black and white of it. There are positive cases. We're gonna to have to quarantine teachers for two weeks. But the bottom line is, is that for the most part, these kids are in school. On occasion, they have to quarantine for 10 to 14 days, just depending on their last exposure. So um, with that, um, that's my answer with kids being in school. And I have to tell you, we meet weekly, we meet numerous times, we meet individually with Rhinelander School District, individually with Lakewood Union, we meet with Vilas and Oneida superintendents every week, we have emails every single day that go to the schools. So we are in communication multiple times a day with all the schools in our district and even schools outside our district as well. So um, it is a very close collaborative relationship and the schools are doing everything that they can to try and keep the kids safe. And those superintendents are, are just, they're working. They're working just like we are long hours, they work on the weekends, we are sending them positives on the weekends so they can assure those positives and those contacts are out of school on Monday. Um, so everybody is working really hard to make this work. And you know, I'm sure some of you saw the transportation issue, um, but right away, once we had the positive bus drivers, the good thing is, is that the bus service implemented the six foot rule on their buses. They have the, the plastic behind the bus driver. So when those drivers tested positive, there weren't some, there weren't close contacts with the students. Um, it took out some bus routes, but it didn't take out any kids. So that was a really a positive and evidence that people are truly, truly trying to implement strategies to keep people safe. Um, the next question is, uh, <laughs> what control? Does the health department have over open bars and restaurants? None. If they do inspections, do failed inspections cause for closing a restaurant? Yes, but it takes a lot to actually fail in an inspection. If COVID safeguards are not in place, can they close a restaurant? No. That's how I'm just gonna answer those questions related to restaurants and bars. We have no power. Um, that was mostly stripped from us from the Supreme Court decision. Um, do county health departments have enough staff to take on extra health load at this time? Um, again, as I showed you in the data, cases fluctuate every single day. So we developed what is called crisis standards, and that's based off of a DPH document for contact tracing. So sometimes we do have enough staff and sometimes we don't. Um, based on those crisis standards, um, we have moved to what we call a tier three permanently based on our caseload, um, but we have kind of a tier 3.5 and a tier four and a 4.5. So we're kind of middle ground. And, and what tier three means is that um, the health department will contact every single positive or attempt to contact every single positive within 24 hours. Usually it's much less. Usually we get through all of our positives in a day, but sometimes um, it takes a little longer. And when we do get a hold of those positives, what we have prioritized are students and school 
you know, teachers and, and anything related to school. We have prioritized um, employers, but we give the information to the employers and the employers do their own contact tracing. We have prioritized household contacts and then any, any contacts outside of the household and high risk, we have prioritized high risk. Anything outside of that household, basically, besides the things that I said, people are doing their own contact tracing. And I'm going to let Jane talk for a few minutes because she's actually one of our contact tracers, as she said. And I think she can speak a little bit about her contact tracing efforts that she has done for the county. And um, included in that could be the change into our tier three. And then also some of the reactions and some of um, the things that the contact tracers go through. It's, it's not always fun. So Jean, do you wanna talk a little bit about sure. what we do with contact tracing? And, and I will also mention that we do have another contact tracer, Jane Banning, who's another member who's attending the meeting. So Jane, if you wanna like wave, yeah. If there's anything Hi, Jane, you wanna, you there. <laughs> if you wanna, you know, anything you wanna add in, maybe type it in a, a chat um, and then we can all see it. But um, so, when we first started doing this, we were contacting contacts. The difference between a contact and a positive is that a positive is tested positive for COVID. A contact is somebody who has had close contact, work contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID. So first we were calling people and saying, we can't tell you who, but you have been in close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID and your um and that last date of contact was you know the first of november and based on that contact we need to ask you to quarantine for 14 days and that is what we did pretty much through most middle of september i i guess i would say right linda um yeah as far as contacting all of the contacts right mm -hmm. uh, when we reached the point where we were getting 35 positive tests a day, then it was like, whoa, we've got to get a hold. So you can't find the contacts until you talk to the person who is positive. So, and, and the tricky thing about all of this is, is that 48 hours before somebody develops symptoms is when they're most contagious. So they don't know that they're sick. Um, so the job of the contract tracers at this point has been quickly to get in touch with the, the positives, convince them to quarantine, but find out when did they first start feeling crummy, if we can do that, some people don't have symptoms, and find out who they were with the 48 hours before that. And those are the people that, that Linda outlined um, you know, were you at school? Were, are you a healthcare worker? Where were you at work? Um, and it's most of the time people are very, very cooperative. I mean, uh, and, and I think Jane, you can probably nod your head yes on that too. I mean, people, the response is, yeah, I've been expecting your call. Um, and it sometimes it's a little sad because they say, well, we knew this was inevitable. And I'm thinking, all right, so why didn't you stay home? But I can't say those things. Part of the job of a contact tracer is to build rapport with the people that they're speaking to so that there is trust, so that they will tell you what they've been doing. And, um, you know, I, I ended up with a family of like seven people. It was really long. It pretty much took the whole evening. Um, and somewhere halfway through it, the mother who was the positive said, okay, I've got to be honest with you. That car that I told you we were looking at on Saturday, we went and bought it yesterday. Okay, now that means that that salesperson that was test driving that car with you on Saturday, it was also filling out the paperwork with you. That person is a close contact. There's no judgment in this. You didn't know you were getting sick, um, but now we need to be able to let them know too. Um, in tier three, which is where Linda says we are at this point, I would be telling that person to call the salesperson and tell her that she tested positive. Um, we have jurisdictional issues. 
because maybe she bought that car in Marathon County. So, uh, you know, we're all working as hard as we can. The main goal here is to keep from spreading the joy. And um, the best way to keep from spreading the joy is to quarantine if you've been um, in close contact with somebody. And if you're positive, definitely to quarantine. Uh, right now we're in a place in Oneida County where we're, I'm contacting people that were household contacts two weeks ago, but now they've tested positive. It's really difficult for families to quarantine from each other. It's possible. And there's some very interesting, amusing stories like the, the, the wife who said, you mean I get to go live in my she shed for 10 days? Great. <laughs> Okay, but most people don't have that option. And, it, you know, they've got babies clinging to them. So, you know, um, but people are, they do the best they can. They have a lot of questions. And some of them say yes. And I think, okay, yeah, that's what you're saying. But that's not necessarily what you're doing. But most people are, are good with that. So um, at the end of the day, if I can feel like I've gotten through to one or two people that are going to stay home because they have a better understanding of what's happening here than they did before I spoke with them, um, I feel like it's been worth it to us. Jane, do you have anything to add? Jane Banning? Um, I'm really am, um, amazed by the spectrum of responses I've gotten, <clears throat> but like Jane said, almost everybody has been really pretty gracious. Um, I thought uh, folks would be, some would be extremely angry and maybe they were earlier, Linda, I don't know, but it's it's becoming more and more common around here that people are testing positive. I've had people who have cried, they feel guilty and horrible. It's not your fault, you know, you, did, you were doing the best you could most of the time. <laughs> um, I had a gentleman just tonight when, who was coughing so much we couldn't finish our interview. Um, so it really runs the whole gamut. Um, but people, people again, are um, pretty acquiescent. And I haven't had a lot of people who are freaking out. Um, maybe like I would freak out. <laughs> um, so it's, um, it's really, really interesting and important work, I think. Yeah, and, and thanks for that. And, and I, I just have to add that um, we do have people that hang up and swear at our contact tracers. And um, that happened a couple of days ago with someone. And, and those are the ones that I think for our staff in-house that um, work, you know, 40 hours a week contact tracing, um, they, they may have a, a few more instances where people are not sharing. They don't want to talk to us. They hang up the phone. They swear at us. Um, because that that's definitely happening. They don't want to tell the truth. You know, you'll talk to the dad and they'll say, well, no, we have nobody else in the home. And then they talk to the mom the next day and they've got two kids. <laughs> Did the dad forget they had two kids? I'm not quite sure. Or we had somebody who didn't want to share information about their kids and their kid, one of their children went to preschool, the Rhinelander School District. Well, we happen to know, and we do some investigating on Facebook and other places and say, oh, well, this is a Rhinelander school parent. They've got the Rhinelander gear all on, and we're going to notify the school that this child cannot be there. Because otherwise, if they're not cooperative with us and they don't tell us that they're in the Rhinelander school district and they send their child to school, that obviously is an issue. Um, so we, we work closely with the schools and um, are able to connect with that. So those are, you know, those are some of the things, but then again, the flip side, we have people that are very gracious and they are appreciative of the information that the contact tracers provide and they are wanting to assist. Um, it is getting to be more commonplace. So we don't, we don't hear as much of the, um, well, we had one instance where it was, please don't tell my employer, but we don't hear that as much. You know, most of the time our, our cases are saying we already contacted our employer. We already contacted our friends or things like that. And that's why when we moved into tier three, it was, it's a little difficult to know that we're not doing contact tracing to the gold standard, but yet 
a lot of people had already been contacting those individuals, their close contacts. The biggest thing that I feel is important as we move into tier three and tier four of, of not doing full contact tracing is making sure people know those infectious periods, the quarantine periods, the isolation periods, so that they can give the right information to their contacts. And that's very important. Um, we offer an email to everybody to um, give them information to help them uh, walk through their contacts, contacting their contacts, so that they give them the right and the correct quarantine dates. So, and Linda, Linda I may just add one thing. We're mm -hmm. all bound by the HIPAA regulations. So if we notify an employer, we're not allowed to say, your employer, Jane Doe, all we can say is you have an employee who tested positive and they were in the office last this and so a date. Yeah, and well, and actually Jane, with that, um, for the most part, we do try and do that. But with COVID, we have been given extenuating circumstances, but we don't like to use that, um, especially when the employer is a little nervous and they don't want that information given. We do everything possible not to tell their name to the employer. Um, difference in school and healthcare; those are those are almost automatic, really, for us to tell the names. But again, that situation arose more frequently. I think you know Jane and Jane. I think it arose more frequently early on. But we are, you know, we are so high in our cases and so frequent that um, people left and right know people positive with COVID. And we're just, we're, it's interesting, we're facing different questions and I think different responses than we did earlier on when people did not wanna tell anybody. Um, and it was a little more tricky that way because we, we really do try not to, although we can by law because it's a public health emergency, we can reveal that we do truly not try not to. Um, and usually in the end it works out. I don't know. We have not really had a lot of situations. So I see, Linda, that there's still a couple other questions on your list. Do you want to move on to? Yeah. Um, so actually, the only other question I have on my list, maybe my list was shortened or I missed a question. Yeah, I have two more questions that were submitted later, but go ahead. Okay. What is the expert's guess on what to expect in the months to come? And what is the main thing I would recommend to make the situation better in the Northwest? Well, I think Governor Evers just answered that question for me. Um, his executive order really goes into how do we make the situation better in the Northwoods, follow his recommendations. It's not, I don't want to say it's not, it is, it's kind of simple, really. You know, it's hard. We're tired. I'm tired. Um, you know, I've had personal um, personal loss during COVID in which my, my parent, my mom was at an assisted living and, um, it was very, very tough. Um, it was, it was tough go. And, um, you know, we are all tired, but the answer is simple. Let's stay away from each other. Let's wear our mask, wash our hands. Don't go out to the bars and, and don't go, you know, to large gatherings. I'm not gonna say it's not difficult, but the answer is simple. Um, and I guess, what are we going to expect? If we don't have the majority of people making changes, we will expect to continue as we are with an, in, with an increase in COVID illness because as everybody knows, and I think I see Dr. Norton part peeking around in there, as we all know, flu season, winter season is a tough time in the Northwoods. COVID is no different. We will see increase in spread with indoor activity, especially as vaccine will not be available to the general public for a while. That first round of vaccines are gonna be available to our healthcare workers, um, and then it'll go down in a tier system. So um, it's gonna be a while until we have that vaccine available to everyone. And hopefully at least 50% of the population will take the vaccine. So. Um, that's my answer to that question. Okay, we have uh, a couple other questions that sort of came in, uh, trickled in after we sent you those. Um, 
one of them has to do, and you spoke to it a little bit, but uh, can you share with us the age ranges, what the age ranges are for those who passed away from COVID in our local counties? The age ranges are all over the place, but most of them are um, 60 and older. I could, hold on a second, I could probably bring that up relatively quickly. Why don't you give me the next question while I'm bringing that down? Well, the, the, the next question is, is uh, you've answered some of that too, guidelines about schools. At what point do they decide to close? And what are the, what, what are the health department rules uh, mm -hmm. for schools? And the so, other part of that question has to do with, does contact tracing help us tell us where spikes and outbreaks are occurring? So um, as far as schools closing, um, we have metrics that we've worked with the schools on and, and they're related to positivity rate, the burden, um, the absentee rate in schools. One of the biggest factors that we have found in, so, so we have metrics, we have metrics for all of that, which means if it hits a certain percentage, we're looking at closing that school. But one of the biggest things that have made the decision about closing schools, quite honestly, is number one, if a grade school kindergarten class where they have really a lot of trouble being physically distanced with these kids and keeping them away. You know, we've seen a whole classroom have to be quarantined. So that obviously is gonna um, close or get that whole classroom. But the biggest decision factor has been teachers. Is there enough teachers to teach? Is there enough substitutes? Is there enough special ed, you know, specialty teachers? Those factors have played probably the biggest role in closing schools. Um, that and um, smaller schools, so your, your Three Lakes and your MHLT and that, um, in addition to that has been just high levels of children being quarantined. Um, so those are the cases for either A, closing schools or B, closing grade levels and classrooms. Um, but we do have metrics that we, that we, um, that we have with each of the schools. Um, and then as far as our death, deaths go, um, our, I'm just looking at raw data here. I don't have the percentages totally in front of me. Um, raw data is that the youngest person that died was born in 1957, nope, I'm sorry, 1963. Um, and our oldest person that has passed was born in 1925. So, I mean, it's really a, a gamut, but our, for the most part, it is people in their 70s and 80s and 90s that are dying, 70 and above. Linda, but, another question that the League of Women Voters likes to ask our speakers is, um, how can we, as uh, League of Women Voters of the North Woods, be helpful to the effort that the health department is making with COVID? You know, I think the biggest thing for people in the community and any organization or group to do is to provide that support of the local health department, whether that is vocally putting out a press release, whether is that, whether that is by modeling, whether that is even adding comments to the Facebook page. Um, you know, one thing that the health department has done is developed a really strong relationship with several chambers of commerce in our area. And one of the things that they have done to support us is just getting messages out to their members and supporting health departments and supporting, still supporting the businesses. But it was the message of how do you do this safely? Require masks before the mask order came out, require the masks after the mask order is done. So that is a great example of how agencies, um, organizations, groups can support the health department is just by um, getting messages out to their members, modeling good behavior, making comments, putting out a press release, um, those type of things are a great support to us. Okay, um, we can open up to questions. 
you can either put them in chat or you can um, unmute yourself and just ask the question. So early on, um, people were very concerned about tactile contact, you know, touching surfaces in the grocery store, touching food and fruit or bringing groceries into the house. Um, how, on the scale of importance, how important is it to be really careful about that kind of tactile contact, Linda? Well, you know, so the CDC has really come out and said there's very minimal risk of, of getting COVID by any of the, you know, carryouts, groceries, et cetera. That doesn't mean that the risk is not there. What it means is that there's minimal risk. And I'm not telling you that if you go to the grocery store and somebody sneezes or coughs or yells and, and droplets land on a product and you take that product and put it in your cart that you do not have that on your hands. I think that is why um, their message has always been wash your hands, you know, immediately sanitize, don't touch your face, wear your mask. By doing all of those things, you are reducing your risk from any of those objects. I mean, yeah, money does, I mean, it can, the virus can survive on money for a period of time. But again, what we have seen over this period of months is that most of our exposures or most of our positives are related to um, a workplace, a gathering um, next to people, knowing a positive. Um, it really hasn't, very few have we been really like flummoxed on why or where they got it. Even people that are totally shut in you still have a person delivering the groceries. We still had somebody coming in, you know, that, that was in contact with them. So our answer through the CDC is that there's minimal risk, but you still need to be careful. And they have indicated that if you are somebody that's undergoing chemo or any procedures that put you at higher risk, dialysis or anything that maybe lupus, anything that compromises your immune system, that you can put your groceries in a different place and not touch them for 48 hours. I mean, that still is a strategy if you are a person that has, um, it is immunocompromised, but they're really not recommending anything like that for the general public, not washing things off before you put them away, or obviously you wash your fruit and vegetables because you should anyway, but you know, not canned goods or boxes or anything like that. Linda, well, this is Karen Kitsy. How safe is going to the dentist? You know, that's a really good question. And um, obviously, I think that's a personal risk that you, you know, you have to um, look at for yourself. The, the dentists wear N95s. So all the dentists wear N95s, which is your top respirator, basically, for protecting both himself or herself and you. Um, and then they wear gloves. I mean, they they wash their hands. I think they're they are you know, they're relatively safe. I mean, it's it, they are in your mouth, and and they are it is an aerosolizing procedure. Um, but they are at risk for aerosolizing from you versus them to you. So I mean, it's relatively safe, I would say, but I can't say it's a hundred percent safe. Again, they wear their mask. It's, is it really any different than if you go to the doctor and they're checking out your mouth and touching you and you know the doctor's taking those precautions and the dentist are taking those same precautions? I will say as a contact tracer, I haven't talked to anybody that for sure thought they'd gotten it from a doctor's appointment or from a dentist appointment. So, um, I'm more concerned about the other patients in those spaces than I am about the healthcare provider. And, and a lot of the dentist places are, um, they are six feet apart. They have removed chairs out of their waiting room. Some of them are actually calling people in and they're not allowing people in the waiting room. So I think those are great questions to ask your dentist before you go and ask them how, what, what strategies have you put in place for COVID?
I have a question. other questions. Um, Your next. Oh, am I on? I have, yep. Can you hear, can you hear me? Um, if you had um, to pick a community in, in Wisconsin or a state in our country or a country in the world where you would think they have an ideal public health system to deal with an issue like this, where could we look to uh, for guidance? You know, um, before COVID, I would have always said Sweden. <laughs> Um, they have a wonderful, wonderful health system. And, um, but during COVID, I don't feel like their response was very good. And so I'm not going to say Sweden. Um, in reality, I think that it's really hard to say as far as countries go. I feel like Spain has had a good response with a lockdown. And, but yet they still have, um, the second round has come and then they only did like a curfew. Um, and then, you know, England had a pretty good spot response, but they totally opened schools and, and had no blended learning. So I think each of the different countries have actually done good things and maybe not, um, you know, have part of their decisions haven't been good. So I, I really, I guess I can't answer Australia, again, I think had a really bad case and, you know, then they locked down and they improved. All of the similarities is with those different countries is that they have had, they saw their cases rise, they locked down and they saw their cases fall. And, and they all did a better job than the United States in those lockdown procedures. They started to see their cases rise again. Um, Spain and, and is one that comes to mind right away. And then they, they didn't do a complete lockdown this second time, they did a curfew. I'm still kind of waiting to see what this second round as a curfew versus a lockdown brings. As far as states go, um, you know, I guess we have been, all the states have been doing something really different and we have all, we have seen almost every state go through a high increase period, no matter what, because California had some of the strongest measures in place and they have a high caseload. Um, New York, they had a very poor beginning, but they have been able to control it since they have brought it down. And, and, and um, Governor Cuomo is changing his strategies as well, but they also have a lot of technology in place where they can quickly identify pockets um, and lock down those pockets of areas versus going the whole state in itself. So I know that doesn't really answer your question because I don't have any, uh, because I think if we actually had an answer, we would be following it, right? Um, but I, I, I could add something to this, perhaps, if it's okay. Go ahead. Um, um, I have family members that are healthcare providers in Australia. Uh, I've seen some um, uh, comments here. Japan and South Korea have done a great job. So is New Zealand. I think that I would tweak the question a little. It isn't what the health departments or the healthcare systems do. It's a partnership. And so those countries that have done well have done well because they've gotten more or less, not unanimously, but more or less behind what they need to do to lock down. And they're not being forced into it, they're buying into it. it, it and that's the difference. They, they want to get back to business sooner and they have somehow been able to be convinced that if we do this in the short term, we'll get back to business quicker in the long term. And, or we'll keep our parents safe or our elders safe or our daughter who's a nurse in the ICU safe. Um, so it's cultural differences, not just healthcare system differences, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that cultural difference and not only the cultural difference, the buy-in, but also the um, enforcement and, and the enforcement of the lockdowns were very different over in, in other countries. So. Um, but all of them have had their increases and, and I guess lockdown is, is your best option, but then there is economic fallout to that as well. But governments have put money into um, maybe 
done a better job in putting money back into those businesses to help them through that, that lockdown. Whereas in the United States, we have not, we've tried, but have not been super successful in feeding, giving money back to those businesses so they can survive the, the lockdown again. And that's where you're getting some of the lack of buy-in. Thank you. I have two quick questions, or maybe they're not quick answers, but one is I remember reading early on about 90 day immunity to you know being reinfected with the virus and now that seems to be changing. So just your thoughts about what you're reading about that. The other question you may or may not wanna answer, but if you could institute an ideal plan and policy right now for um, containment, what would that be? So you can take or leave either question, Linda. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to, you know, really, we're still saying 60 to 90 days for that antibodies. We're going to hold to that until we have enough science, you know, research to, to change that answer. And I think the difficulty in that is, is that we've seen some reinfections, right? A handful of reinfections starting at 60, 60 days and 90 days, but, um, we, we haven't seen a lot, um, and the other hard part about that is your immune system. So right now we're showing antibodies drop off relatively quickly, but we don't know what's happening with those antibodies after exposure. Um, if they have an exposure, are they lying dormant in the body and then they come back up and similar to like um, uh, hepatitis, if that happens with they thought the vaccine the antibodies dropped off very quickly and then they found that um, actually the body's antibodies react when they were exposed to that virus. And so I'm going to leave that at that. And I will wait for more scientific evidence in, in those antibodies because we are relatively new, you know, and we've got different studies looking at different things and studies across the world. And um, we are definitely seeing reinfection, but we're not seeing super high reinfection rates. So we're, we're, I think time is gonna tell that some more. Um, and then, you know, I guess for me, um, the other, the, in a perfect world, you know, everybody would be, everybody would believe in what we're doing. And in a perfect world, we would have funding for businesses. There's a lot of businesses that wanna do the right thing but they can't survive doing the right thing. They have tried and tried. And, you know, I, we have several businesses, several restaurants that, you know, really want to do the right thing, but they're having difficulty. Um, there's restaurants that aren't trying at all, you know, and so, but, you know, I wish that we had the capability of doing another lockdown in a similar manner, but getting the economics under control so that people could have the buy-in. I feel that there's a lot of people that do not believe there's conspiracy theories, you know, out there that they don't believe in COVID, but I think there's a lot of people that realize it's real, but their livelihood is at stake and they're having difficulty um, just doing what they can do to stay alive. And so in the perfect world, those, those places would be given grants. They would be able to choose to run their business in a manner that they did not have to worry about folding or closing. Um, people would wear masks, people would not go out, they would have, we would have more options for delivery, although we do, um, we would even have more of those options. We would have housing options and rental assistance for people that have to stay home because they were exposed, um, but they're an essential worker and their families don't have money. There's, there's just, I could just go on and on with that in a perfect world because there are so many things that um, so many layers that this has impacted people's lives and, and the same with school. I'd want all kids learning from home, but have the ability to learn from home, to be able to learn virtually and not feel isolated and not feel depressed and to actually comprehend and to have the internet access and to have the parent that could make sure that they're at their computer. Um, there's just, I could go on and on, so I won't, but you guys get the picture. There's a lot. Thank you. It was <clears throat> a chance to give you a soapbox moment. 
<laughs> Other questions? Well, Linda, any last words? <laughs> I hate to use it that way. Any final words? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, go ahead, Deb. Oh, Deb has a question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute myself there. Um, okay. This has really, really been helpful. Kind of at a low time. <laughs> you know, it's just that it's been, a, been many months and, and we're trying to do the right thing and trying to be good. And just to hear you kind of, Jane, thank you for those questions, opine on how difficult it is and that compassion and that empathy it, it, for people who don't have choices and have very difficult decisions to make. Um, I, your attitude is wonderful. Your composure, your attitude, your empathy. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing and um, don't burn out, try not to burn out. And, and thank you for all the information. You're welcome, Deborah. And, and, I, and I feel like public health, you know, that's what we're about. We see all of those different factors, the, the different things that really do play a part into our health and, and not only our physical, but our mental um, and all the, the socioeconomic factors that play a part in, in how people can respond. And I think it's very important for people to understand a lot of people don't have choices. A lot of people do not have a choice to go to work or not, to send their child to school or not. Maybe they don't want to, but they, they have no other choice. And, and so, it, you know, I will go back to, you know, the 40 developmental assets, or I will go back to, it takes a village, you know, any of those things that say, it is a community effort. And without the schools doing things, without the health department and healthcare systems and aging and social services, without everybody pulling in together, um, it, is, it, is, it is and it's gonna continue to be difficult to fight this pandemic. Um, but at this point, you know, our biggest, our, our best strategy is for all of us to try and follow the guidance that the governor put out and, and hopefully um, new guidance that will come out at the federal level, which will aid in our response, I think, um, coming up soon. So I just wanna thank everybody and we really do appreciate it. I'm gonna give a shout out to my contact tracers and all of the staff at the health department. Many, many, many people have pulled in from other programs um, they used to be doing other programs. They are now doing contact tracing, at least part of the time, if not full time. And in the meantime, we are doing flu shots and flu clinics and getting ready, ready for COVID vaccination and COVID testing and contact tracing and um, also trying to still do a little bit of other things. And so um, I have to give a shout out to all of my staff that have been phenomenal. And thank you to all the community members that have reached out to us. Um, to the, this group that has mobilized their support. It's truly appreciated and it always brings a smile to people's faces. You know, when we're really tired and getting burned out, it just so happens that, you know, somebody will say something positive or, or do something and we always share that with everyone. So um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak and hopefully um, we can speak again, maybe when COVID is over. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so and feel free to, you know, if if you want to address this group again, we're always looking for more programs. So, um, you know, a couple months from now, or, you know, we have a good communication network. So, can, you know, we can disseminate information that you have for us uh, if, if there's something. Uh, your webpage, your uh, Facebook page is phenomenal. And a lot of people are going to your Facebook page, um, but not everybody's on Facebook. So that's, you know, that's it, what's most important is that we trust your data. And that's, that's huge. Um, yeah, so it's huge. And we work really hard. Again, I have great staff that, you know, work on the data, work on our Facebook page, and it is impaired, it is important. And we take great pride in putting out information that is accurate and transparent and, and we work really hard at that. So thank you for that, I appreciate it.
Thank you, Linda. Um, Thank I'm you. Give a little plug for our next meeting, which is Tuesday, the 8th of December. That's traditionally been our Christmas and social meeting. Uh, we're going to do it on Zoom. Uh, at five o'clock, you'll be getting the uh, link to sign in. It will be a virtual Christmas party. So bring your snacks, bring your beverages, wear your Jingle Bell hats and uh, come with a family tradition to share. And with that, thank you very much. Anybody who wants to hang around for a few more minutes and chat, we can do that, but we're done with the meeting.